Hello everyone, welcome into the second episode of Tech Talk. Now for you who doesn't know Tech Talk yet, Tech Talk is a web series where we feature a diverse set of young uh, scholars, scientists from all over the world to talk about their research study in the hope that it will inspire criminologists and forensic scientists to also engage in research that will advance their respective fields. And in today's Tech Talk episode, we will be featuring a young aerospace engineer whose research is on constellations of nanosatellites. So without any further ado, let's call on Engineer Malik. Hello, Engineer Malik. Hey, how are you? Oh, first of all, before we start the interview, I would like to thank you for accepting the invitation to be the second resource speaker in our Tech Talk series. Thank you very much, Christian, for having me today. Um, I'm very excited to discuss my research uh, with you. It's a great opportunity for all of us, I think. So our speaker for today is actually an aerospace engineer. And in 2019, he actually finished his master's in aerospace engineering, specializing in nanosatellites from Stanford University, one of the most prestigious universities in the world. And right now, he's actually studying at the ETS Montreal for his uh, doctor's degree. So Malik, let's get into it. No? Let's, uh, let's ask the important questions in today's interview. So my first question to you is, what is aerospace engineering exactly? And how does it differ from any other branches of engineering? Aerospace engineering is just a sub-branch of um, the engineering, generally speaking, which is interested mostly in the design of aircraft, um, which are basically everything that uh, is flying above our heads. So including planes and drones and also interested in the second part which is astronautic and the design of spacecraft so all the artificial satellites that we put into orbit in our upper atmosphere and this is the part i will be discussing today Wow, thank you for that brief definition because for me when i hear about aerospace engineering i always hear about uh, elon musk SpaceX, NASA, things like that. So it's very interesting now that we are talking, I'm talking to someone who is actually in that field of study. So Malik, my second question to you is actually an introduction to your research study. Your study is about constellations of nanosatellites. So I have several questions there to make the research study more understandable to the common audience. And that is number one, what are nanosatellites and how do they differ from regular satellites that we have? But second, what do you mean by constellation of satellites? Okay, so this is a great question. A nanosatellite is basically a satellite whose size is not much bigger than a shoebox. So typically between a few centimeters to several, to several meters at most, and whose weight is between one and 10 kilograms. So this is in drastic contrast with traditional satellites, uh, which which can weigh several tons and uh, reach several hundred, not several, but at least 100 meters of length for the biggest ones. Um, and still, even with this drastic mass and size reduction, a nanosatellite is able to do almost as many things as a traditional satellite, including transmitting and receiving signals from uh, from the ground and from different constellations in the in the sky, um, capturing images. Second part of your question, what I mean by constellations is a set, a group of satellites that are working together in collaboration, that are um, communicating with each other and uh, performing maneuvers together, etc. So typically, uh, we start to call it a constellation for satellites when you have more than 100, for, in, for instance, uh, which is a higher number than what you would call a constellation of traditional satellites. Um, for instance, like the GPS constellation is only 30 satellites. And for nanosatellites, you can have up to several thousands of uh, satellites working together. So my next question is, what made you interested with nanosatellites? Um, so, as I grew up, I was always very fascinated by everything that could fly and especially like space exploration with all the movies and uh, science fiction that's around it, you know, uh, that's really fascinating when you're a kid and inspiring. Uh, but as I grew up, I also realized that unfortunately, like space industry is really reserved to only a handful of countries who can afford it, right? It's mm. having a, a real space program is really a luxury. 
even nowadays. Um, and so when I heard about nanosatellites and how they could basically reduce and drive down drastically the cost of space missions, I was immediately like really interested in do that. Um, and the reason for this drastic uh, size and mass reduction and also uh, lowering the cost is because we are able to benefit from a lot of research and development that was put in our smartphones. So all the technology that you can fit in into this small object is just amazing. And the question is, why not do it into space, right? Why not apply the same reasoning? Why not try to reduce the size, reduce the mass, so that we can reduce the cost of design, we can reduce the cost mm. of launching the object into space? Nanosatellites are really trying to democratize you know, the space programs so that not only a handful of countries can afford it, but on also like a lot of other countries and um, perhaps smaller companies, smaller institutions that don't have the big funding that uh, NASA would have, for instance. So I think this is really a major milestone for um, the evolution of uh, space programs. Wow, Malik, that's really inspiring. You just wanted space exploration to be more accessible. So now that it's clear what nanosatellites are and why were you interested with them, let's now talk about your research study. So my simple question is, can you tell us what your research is all about in English? <laughs> okay, so I will try to break it down in, as of now, the problem with nanosatellites that you can encounter is that as you reduce their size and their math, you are also reducing the performances of the sensors and all of all um, the elements that you embed inside, right? And if we talk about the navigation part, which is everything that is interested in uh, localizing the, the satellites in space, we are only using very cheap GPS receivers that can only uh, localize you at the order of one meter, you know? So that's mm -hmm. still very coarse. And that can, that can bring us several problems. So for instance, one of the big problems that you have in low orbit is that there are so many space debris and you have to avoid it, avoid them permanently. Otherwise you can just crash on one and your mission can terminate. And it's like several hundreds of thousand dollars that are just wasted mm -hmm. like this. So you really need a system that is able to provide you with a very accurate estimate of your current position. And so what I was working on is developing an algorithm that is able to not only leverage the information that a satellite is receiving from a particular GPS uh, constellation, but also try to leverage information that uh, other satellites within the same constellation are receiving. So for instance, if you and I are two satellites and we belong to the same constellation, we are working in collaboration so we can communicate with each other. Mm. So maybe that instead of only using my own information, like the, the information from my own sensors, I can al also require to have yours and you can send me yours. And maybe that if I, am, if I find a clever way to combine these two information, I can end up with a more precise estimation of my position. Mm. So this is the type of algorithm that I've been working on. And it's extremely challenging, but it could be extremely rewarding in the sense that as you decrease your hardware, if you are able to improve the efficiency of your software, you can end up preserving very strict requirements in accuracy. And, and so such algorithm will enable you to go from an estimation at the order of one meter to an estimation that is at the order of a centimeter of, or a millimeter. So Malik, now that we know what your research study is, it's about proving the deployment of constellations of nanosatellite. My next question is, what benefit can we get from uh, development of or deployment of constellations of nanosatellites in outer space? Constellations have a tremendous advantage. And the fact that actually you can build very small satellites and launch a lot of them at the same time is really important because let me give you just a quick example so typically a nanosatellite will take 90 minutes to orbit and to come back to the same point above the sky right to, orb to orbit the earth yeah yeah 
okay, and to come back to the same point above above your your head, for example. If you have two satellites, it will take you 45 minutes to have a revisit, etc. If you had ten, it will only take you like how much? Six uh, nine minutes. Sorry. If you have a hundred, it means that every less than every minute, every 54 seconds, you will have a satellite orbiting around you, right? Passing. In. So if you have satellites that can take images, and this is typically an application of nanosatellites, it means that if you add as many satellites to cover all the latitudes, it means that you can have an image of every point on the surface of the planet every minute. So that's really unprecedented. That's a, this frequency is extremely important in so many applications. Um, also, scientists are very willing to use that kind of technology in order to track the environmental changes. So, for example, the ice melting and the glaciers that are receding, that are like both a consequence and a cause of uh, global warming. You can more precisely track these changes using this kind of imagery. Um, I don't know if you are like tracking. Uh, illegal deforestation, if you are tracking illegal fishing, imagine all the possibilities that you can have with like one image per minute on every point of the earth, right? Wow. So if you couple this, not only with humans, because this, this is like so many images to treat, but if you couple this with powerful algorithms that are able to detect meaningful changes, then you end up with a very powerful technology that can be applied in so many different domains that wow. I just cited. And probably I'm like citing only one tenth of the possible applications. One of the applications that, were, that I was particularly interested in was also that those satellites, instead of cap capturing images, could also serve as um, routers for internet and provide like global, a global coverage, especially to remote wow. areas remote areas that are that you could typically not reach with ground-based uh, fiber networks and ground-based infrastructure that would be way too expensive to uh, to develop in order to reach such rural or uh, underprivileged areas. And with this kind of technology, well, you don't really care if the land is isolated or not, because anyways, the, the satellite is gonna pass over this land no matter what. So if you have as many antennas as you can, as you need to cover the full earth, so that would be like roughly several thousands, which is not a crazy number actually. Like SpaceX is actually putting this kind of, this, this order of magnitudes of satellites into orbit. Well, you can easily imagine having like a global coverage and provide internet access to a lot of communities that don't have this access which is like, by, by the way, estimated to roughly 40% of the global population. So this is, not, this is not marginal at all. So Malik, you've convinced us already that this technology has really so many uh, benefits and potential applications and um, could probably improve the quality of life of the people here on Earth. So Malik, a lot of our viewers are actually undergraduate students and professors from different universities, and they may be interested in studying in universities in the United States, such as your university, which is Stanford. Um, so my question is, uh, how was your U.S. academic experience? Was it very difficult? Uh, were you still be able to balance uh, your studies and at the same time trying to explore American culture, the places in the United States? So... From an academic standpoint, purely, uh, this experience was extremely enriching, especially I felt it was very complementary to my French training in the sense that they really push students towards autonomy, right? So if you go, if you're looking for a research project, for instance, and you go see a professor, he won't give you like immediately a project or an idea to pursue that is like well cut. You will rather encourage you to think about your own interests, develop an idea and then come back. I was very pleased with the, the way I, uh, I organized myself. I think I was able to take the, the most out of my experience. Um, I did a lot of trips in national parks. 
uh, Yosemite Park, for example, or Sequoia National Park. Um, also across this, some very beautiful cities such as New York and Philadelphia. And also, I think uh, a very nice part of my experience was being a Fulbright Scholar, uh, because it also allowed me to meet other people from other universities, not just Stanford. Um, that, and those people are often like exceptional. They are selected based on their leadership capabilities, etc. So it's, uh, it was definitely like the enrichment <laughs> seminar in Philadelphia was definitely one of the highlights of my uh, US experience. Mm -hmm. That's actually where we've met, right? Uh, we, I actually uh, met inside the bus on our way to the opening dinner, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I remember very precisely, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you were, I was quite astonished with your research and I said like, maybe someday uh, we can, you know, okay. collaborate into yeah. something so that we could. Here comes, uh, here comes yeah. that. <laughs> and here, <laughs> here it was, finally, we were able to collaborate. So yeah, uh, do you have any people that you want to thank? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so first, I would like to thank all the people that made this trip possible. So, of course, the Fulbright program and committee, but also the Fondation Isaac Peiro and Fondation Monan. Um, and I would like to also thank the professors and especially Professor D'Amico, who warm, warmly welcomed me in his lab and helped me a lot carry out my research. Um, and more generally, like, all the teaching staff in Stanford, which I found absolutely amazing and super devoted to uh, the student community. Thank you, Christian, for having me. It was a great pleasure for me to share my research. Uh, and I think that it's very important uh, for scientists to share their research because at the end of the day, we are also doing this for all the people. And so it's also very important for us to have platforms where we can express. So once again, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Yeah, Malik, you're welcome in our Tech Talk anytime. So maybe you could, in the next uh, time that you will uh, serve as a resource speaker, you could talk about your dissertation. Good luck with your PhD. Keep us posted. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. So guys, that's basically it. That ends our interview. And if you learned something from this video, please don't forget to like. Uh, and at the same time, please uh, subscribe so we could keep on producing videos like this. Thank you very much for watching and see you on the next video.